Well, this is one of the major problems that we've had that led to the major crisis that started in 2008. Uh, many people are not necessarily aware of the fact that a lot of the liquidity that found its way into some of the crazy products that created the, the credit bubble and the real estate bubble and eventually all the pain that followed really was a result of the uh, what we call the global savings glut, the fact that the major exporting countries um, accumulated a creating account surplus and therefore uh, a really large amount of foreign exchange reserves uh, while the importing countries like the United States uh, are accumulating really large deficits and in current account deficits and the, because in essence they were the borrower and the spender of last resort so the major exporting countries like uh, China pretty much has at uh, this point uh, a foreign exchange reserve war chest of close to in fact more than 2.4 trillion dollars it is believed that about 70 percent of it is actually invested in u.s denominating assets many of them uh, in fact found their way into u.s treasuries and they helped keeping interest rates really low in this country which again fueled a lot of the credit bubble uh, that led to the crisis other exporting countries which really, uh, which carry really large uh, uh, surpluses are Germany and most of the Asian countries. Um, that is a major issue and uh, it, it does create a constant systemic instability. It is my view that eventually when everything is said and done um, at the end of this crisis there would be some major changes not only in terms of capital requirements for financial institutions and for banks and uh, um, uh, and, and from the regulatory point of view, but certainly also from the uh, currency exchange system. Every time in history we've had a, a crisis of this magnitude, there was eventually some change in the way we deal with each other, the payment level. I mean, just looking at the last 60, 70 years, after World War II, we had the Bretton Woods Agreement, which basically backed most of the currencies to the US dollar, and then it made the US dollar convertible into gold at a fixed price of $35. Uh, that went out the window in the 70s with the Nixon administration during the uh, great crisis of the 70s with the, uh, uh, the, the chaos following the Vietnam War and those deficits in those days. And that created a system that we have today, which has been very unstable of currencies, some of which are very uh, are freely floating and some are not flo freely floating at all. Some are managed and some are very manipulated. And that's been a source of constant imbalances. Um, I believe that probably in the future there will be some great adjustments, maybe the inclusion of the SDRs, the Special Drawing Rights, which is a special currency which is only used internally at the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, or maybe a resurgence of gold, not necessarily as the, the center of our global payment system, but maybe as part of it. Uh, some change, I believe, will definitely uh, come to light in the future. Well, obviously, so far, it has helped them tremendously in being the low-cost producer and exporter uh, of the globe. And that's why they very actively try to manage the currency and keep it, a, you know, probably uh, very much undervalued uh, versus, say, the U.S. dollars and the euro and some other uh, freely floating currencies. But that comes with a price, and that is basically... Um, a subpar financial system that cannot really uh, deal efficiently with uh, investment from abroad, that does not provide um, great choices to its citizens in terms of investment choices. And certainly the major problem is the inflation. And that is something that is now being recognized in Beijing. Uh, and it's been questioned whether or not the advantages that come from having an undivided currency are still better than the disadvantages that are coming with the inflationary pressure that are clearly uh, creeping up in the system. So it is now believed that steps are being taken in Beijing and that the renminbi will be allowed to revalue probably at least 5% this year and that some other steps are being taken in the direction of creating a better system. At the end of the day, if China wants to be the next economic superpower, it cannot have a 
currency, that it's not convertible, that it's uh, subsidized, that it's undervalued. We will have to take all the steps uh, to create a strong, uh, fully convertible currency. Well, again, for now, there's a fairly, very strict pact, uh, about 6.5 renminbi per dollar, uh, and that's fully managed by uh, the Chinese government. Uh, it is believed, that, and there's only, there's only a little bit of fluctuation that is that is, it is allowed. Uh, it is believed that the, the, the range of fluctuation will be expanded and that will lead to a gradual revaluation of the renminbi over the next few months. Uh, there are also steps that are being taken in terms of uh, rebalancing uh, uh, those situations of disequilibrium that we were talking about before. And so China is now trying to actually uh, create an internal demand and not being so reliant on just exporting goods to the rest of the world. And that's what the system eventually needs. It needs a much more balanced economic uh, uh, system where the United States uh, will be not necessarily always the last uh, resource spender and borrower and where China and Germany and some of the other exporting countries will not rely strictly on exporting their goods and services to the rest of the world. Um, again, exporting countries will have to increase internal demand and the United States will have to decrease its spending binge. Until next time, this is David Akramatsa. You can find out more at gbr.pepperline.edu. Thank you.